I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. It is so good to be here with you tonight, celebrating the Feast of the Incarnation, the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a funny thing how year after year we find ourselves here, or perhaps in a similar place, and we hear the Christmas story, and if you're anything like me, there's something about it that sounds a little bit different every year. There's something that catches my ear a little bit differently, that maybe resonates with a new depth. There's all kinds of reasons why this might be true. We find ourselves in different stages of life, we approach the Christmas story from a different place. We find ourselves with faith that's grown, or maybe with doubts that we just can't quite shape this season. For me personally, one of the things that really jumped out at me as, as my wife Becky and I expect our first child is just the sheer number of people that get packed into what is essentially the maternity ward of the barnyard. The sheer number of people that get packed around that manger when poor Mary has just given birth without any drugs, without any help. And bewildered Joseph, who's not really sure what he's gotten himself into, has to look on. What an extraordinary, extraordinary experience of God's grace. Probably didn't feel a whole lot like grace in that moment. I've talked a lot this Advent season about the need to push past the over-sentimentalized, whitewashed, hallmark version of Christmas that we so often find. Baby Jesus in his golden diapers, who not a noise he makes in this idyllic manger scene. But despite all of the things that I, all the reasons I've given, and I'm sure they were all really good reasons to push past that sentimentality, the truth is there's, there's lots of reasons why we might really want that tonight. I come to this service, even though this is my job and my vocation, I come to this kind of service with an expectant heart hoping and trusting that I'll find a measure of grace that somehow isn't so easily available in common hours. And when the world around us gets scary, and 2016 hasn't exactly been the most wonderful year in recent memory. Uh, maybe you've seen internet memes that put that in slightly less polite terms. Uh, 2016 has given us lots of reasons to feel scared from time to time. We all have different reasons to know our own brokenness and to feel insecure in our lives. And so, on a night like tonight, it is fair enough for us to want some measure of comfort, even if it is sentimental. It's fair enough for us to want belief. It's fair enough for us to want some hope. And underneath that sentimentality, I think what we really want is to know that we're loved. I think we want to know that relationships and family and friends surround us we want to know that hope isn't necessarily lost. That deep down, God isn't somewhere else and removed from the world, but actually near to us. That perhaps this crazy world might work out okay in the end, even if we don't exactly know how that might be true. The bad news tonight is that I still think we need to push past that sentimentality. But the good news is that what we find if we do is even better than that superficial hope that we might come looking for. The truth of the Incarnation is an extraordinary thing. The idea that God, who created all things, somehow takes on human flesh and comes to dwell among us is almost such a big concept that it's hard to even begin to talk about it. It's true in a way that goes beyond words. And we actually see this reflected in the way that Luke himself writes about the birth of Jesus. The words that he chooses to use are actually pretty simple on their own. The narrative story is pretty basic. Mary and Joseph find themselves in Bethlehem because they've been ordered to do so by the Roman authorities. While they're there, she goes into labor, they give birth. An angel appears to some shepherds who hear the good news and come to join them. It's actually a pretty basic story. But Luke packs this narrative with more than words. Luke begins by using words that even at the time 
he was writing were actually antiquated. He's writing in a way that is intended to mirror the old language found in Hebrew scriptures. He's writing in a way that's supposed to echo for us and for his first audience the idea that this isn't a new story that's come out of nowhere. This is continuous with the whole story of salvation, dating back to the earliest parts of scripture. And Luke begins the story with a nod to the Roman Empire, the oppressors who are holding down the people of God and demanding that they return to wherever it is they come from so that they can be inventoried and taxed. And hanging against this Roman imperial backdrop is the promise of salvation, the promise of a Messiah, of a king like King David, who would throw off the oppressors and make everything okay again. And so Luke explains that this takes place in Bethlehem, which in Hebrew is actually two words. It's Beth, which means house, and Lehem, which means bread. This story takes place in the city of David, in the house of bread, a place which, ironically enough, has known famine in Scripture, a place which has been the occasion for people contemplating what it means for God to give abundantly to his people, a place which is not only the city of David, but comes for us to be the place where the bread of life himself would be born. And not only that, we see David echoed again and again. King David, the greatest of the Jewish kings, was himself a shepherd. And so we see the shepherds as the first recipients of this good news. And we see that these shepherds who are far off somehow have this new and interesting place in this story. Luke paints for us a simple narrative, but he packs it with all kinds of meaning that I think underscores for us the truth that the incarnation is at its core a mystery. But we're not so much invited to explain away as gaze at in a kind of awestruck wonder and consider the extraordinary grace of God. And for all the simplicity of the story, the climax is really unusual, isn't it? There's the birth, but more than the birth, there is this appearance, this fearsome appearance of an angel before shepherds. It's worth noting here that shepherds are at the bottom rung of society in the ancient world. They're dirty, they smell bad, they sleep outside. They're not the kinds of people that you invite over for a dinner party, much less into the room that you've just given birth in. They're not the kinds of people that you would think would be the first ones to receive this good news of great joy. And even more amazingly, the angel doesn't just say to these shepherds, there's a baby that's been born. The angel actually says, for you, a child is born. For you, humble shepherds, who have no reasonable claim to much of anything in this life. For you, a child is born. And so the shepherds do what you would do if an angel appeared before you. They do what the angel asked them. And they go and find Mary and Joseph. And they press in and see the baby Jesus. And if you're like me, you're probably picturing an outdoor stable with lots of animals in a manger and Jesus laying there in this kind of idyllic silent night. But actually, the word that gets translated in, as in there's no room for them at the inn, is more likely not a commercial inn, but a family home. Joseph, who has relatives in Bethlehem, that's where he's from, probably gone to a family home expecting that they would find some room for them. And maybe because they're overfilled, maybe because the family's not so sure what they think of this whole baby out of wedlock thing, this is entirely scandalous. For some reason or another, there's no room for them in the proper dwellings, in the upper rooms. And so they get put in the bottom room with the animals and the smell and the hay and the manger. And so the inn that they find themselves in is actually a lower room in an ancient home. It's not spacious, it's not outside, it's not well ventilated. It's cramped. This is the place the shepherds come, and they knock on the door, and they're let in, and they press in close. And they lean over the side of the manger, and they gaze upon an extraordinary sight. 
to gaze upon the face of God. And these shepherds, who have no claim to this story, who aren't part of the family, somehow find themselves in this incredibly intimate space. It's early days for us, yet we're not due until uh, the end of May or the beginning of June. But as we learn more and more about what's involved in giving birth, Becky has made very clear that no one is always welcome in the birthing room. Maybe me, that changes from day to day. But this idea of an assortment of family and strangers passing wise men and shepherds, that is not on, I'll tell you. <laughs> Amazingly enough, in this most intimate space that we kind of protect for close family, we find shepherds who haven't had time to have a shower on their way from the fields. And as they gather around, they discover something extraordinary. They are not only shepherds that night. They're not only coming with the cares and concerns of their lives. They're not just people at the bottom of the world's social order. They find themselves somehow, mysteriously, made heirs and inheritors of the kingdom of God. Members of the Holy Family. Part of God's chosen people. With no claim or expectation of finding this extraordinary blessing, they find themselves gazing upon the face of God. And so, we may desire, for various reasons, the warm and fuzzy feeling that we get from remembering good Christmases past, all those sentimental things, Charlie Brown Christmas, black and white movies, it's a wonderful life, all the things that make us forget our cares and concerns. But, like those shepherds, if we lean in a little bit, we'll find there's something even better waiting for us. See, on tonight, we are reminded that we are all invited into that birthing room with the shepherds and anyone else who's passing by. We're invited to lean in and gaze into the crash. And for one night, even if we can't bear the thought or justify it to ourselves at other points in the year, tonight, we can take comfort and hope and joy in the knowledge that God is not far away, but actually present to us. This world is not doomed, no matter what is going on in the news or what new scary thing is cooking. This world at its core, is held lovingly in the palm of a God who is so concerned for us that he takes on human flesh and comes to dwell among us. And so we find ourselves much like the shepherds, perhaps with no sense that we are entitled to this, perhaps with no real way of knowing how we find our way into this room. And yet, we are reminded that we are loved, that we are not alone, that there is no distance that we can put between us and God that will actually keep him away. That no matter how messy and scary life gets, deep down, God will make all things well. So my friends, on this Christmas night, I invite you to lay aside your weariness, your fears, your doubts, all the things that on any other night we might let get in the way. Leave them aside and follow the call of the angel, the journey to that birthing room in Bethlehem, in the house of bread, the house of abundance, as we are invited to lean in with shepherds and strangers and peer into the face of God. Amen. Amen. We continue to celebrate the wonderful feast of the incarnation of the Timothy, the feast of Christmas, the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the record of Luke and Matthew of the events are very real in terms of the human experience. As we think of this miracle that happened in a real sense, that, that God in some way touched humanity 
in real time. It is set in the context of a real, of a human story. The human experiences. Think of it. The story of the angel, for example, announcing some startling news to Zechariah. The angel announcing confusing news to Joseph. The angel announcing startling, surprising news to, to Mary. The angel announcing some good news to the shepherds. In every instance, you have been there in your own journey where you have heard startling news, surprising news, troubling news, confusing news, good news, very human experience. And you have had, we read in the account of the gospel. We live in a world of government. Government determines policy, and they do it in ways that at times are concerning, at times we appreciate and value. So it was in that time. The Roman government, to set its policy, determined to count people, figure out where they were, who they were, and no doubt determine what they got. Government gave instructions to go and do this and go and do that. And they complied, as we comply. That's the reality of living in a civilized world. Governments determine many things in our lives. And we fit into the scheme of things. But more than that, think of Mary. Young girl, pregnant, making a journey to visit with family and friends as the government had requested. A journey that was no doubt challenging. Imagine her, there being no Uber in her time or, or, or then a taxi. She had to make her way with her husband to be on terrain that can be treacherous, hilly, challenging. But she had to make that challenging journey, as you have, as I have in our own story from time to time. Very real stories. And when she got to her home, it was a very small community. Not sure if there were any inns in that community. There were homes. And as she went back to her home, or family who were still in Bethlehem. To discover, because of her long journey, she got there a little bit late, and the room that she may have gotten was not taken by cousin Susie or cousin Betty, or somebody else. So she had to find room someplace else. Not space for her in the comforts, but someplace else. Have you been there in some way? Job perhaps, or in church perhaps, or some place where you did not feel the welcome and the comfort but had to go and fit yourself in some place else? That's the journey. What is more for her? Not only no room to find to rest her head after a long, arduous journey, <laughs> But perhaps because of her situation, not yet married, young and pregnant, you don't do that in small communities. How dare you get pregnant and not married? Familiar in our old societies. Not so much today, but that was rather meaningful. And so the shame and the scandal that was brought upon the family, in their opinion, was hers to bear. Have we, in our own journeys in terms of time, had to suffer <coughs> the other's judgments about our actions, of who we were or who we are? 
But that's the journey of life. So you see that, you should have seen in this story of the birth of Jesus, the human experience that we all at some point in our lives are part of. Because we talk troubling news, disturbing news, confusing news, good news, long, arduous journeys, exclusion, being judged. But it's not all bad news or troubling news in the story. There was good news. The shepherds heard something good. They were exposed to the terror attacks of wild animals. That, that, that was possible. Because of their job, they were despised and ridiculed as not really in the in crowd. But it was to them that the good news came. And they were so happy to hear the angel telling them there's good news and they can go and see where that good news is. They gladly went and discovered something good. Something good if but for once had attended them. Have you been there? Then, notwithstanding the journeys of life, the travels of life, judgment and ridicule and exclusion, and all things that seem so bad and, and painful. Why me? Have you at some point, have I at some point had reason to say, but this is good news? This, notwithstanding all that I have endured or I am enduring, this is something good that is happening. And having discovered that piece of good experience, have we been willing to tell somebody else about it? To bring them, you know, not, no matter what happened, I know this is good. Let me tell you about it. That's what the shepherd says. Something good has happened. We heard it. We've come to tell you about it. They we knew, right? But they want to tell her what they had heard. They were overwhelmed with joy that they heard the angels tell them, confirming for her what she had heard. And they're told she kept these things in her heart and pondered. I wonder for how long. Was it all his life? Or even at the end of his life, when he was on the cross, as she stood there, was she still pondering in her heart what all of that meant? Perhaps. Whatever the case, she gave thought to the good news the shepherds told her. I'm sure that people have been given pause to consider the good news you have told them. It could be about anything, but they are able to sit and consider that is wonderful. I'm glad for you. We do our best because of that. They ponder and consider that there are good things that happen to people still, and we can share those stories. But what is more? Not only did she tell the he did they tell her the story, they left that place and were all rejoicing, praising God, no doubt telling the world what they had heard. And they had not only heard, but they had seen this news in real life. That yes, for us, a Savior has been born. And that's good news. That's what I believe the Christmas story is about. For us to consider human tragedy, consider human surprises, consider the confusing life we, we at times experience, but to know that in all of this, God steps in and opens up something brighter and better 
something joyful. God brings joy in so many ways. The story is he brought joy in the birth of Jesus. Surely in your life and my life, God has brought joy in other persons. And for that, we are thankful. Surely in your life and my life, we have brought joy to other persons. And for that, we give God thanks. So as we join the Christian church across the world, celebrating this wonderful moment, which by coincidence also happens at the time of Jewish cousins are celebrating Han, where in their story, God did something marvelous. In their story, God did something marvelous. That we also share, for we share that common heritage with our Jewish brothers and sisters. So here we are. They are having one celebration. We have two. There's the ones. Because in these stories, we see God bringing deliverance and protection and care for all of God's children. So, my friends, reflect on our life's journey. The challenges, the confusion, the doubt, the pain, but the moments when those lights click and see the glory of God revealed in our lives and pause to wonder that God is still good to me. God is still good to us. And we can tell others those stories of joy and love. And we all can say, yes, we know, for we have in some way experienced God. So go home and when you are at your dinner table today, our lunch table, whatever it is, before the spirits get going and you get to lose your head, just tell each other that one thing where the joy was such that you knew surely God is with us. Emmanuel. May God bless us this Christmas time and forevermore.